Thanks very much, uh, Dickie. Thank you, Faith, for reading, Andrew for leading. It's great to be at church, isn't it, friends? Wonderful to be here today. Uh, let's pray as we begin. Father God, we rejoice to gather as your people. Father, we pray that uh, the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all of our minds may be pleasing in your sight, our God, our rock and our redeemer. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's an Olympic year. Isn't that exciting? I mean, we hope so. It's, it's a bit touch and go, but uh, it looks like the Olympics are going ahead. It's only, I think, 33 days until the 2020 Olympics being held in 2021. It's a bit confusing, I know, but it's exciting, isn't it? Don't you love the Olympics? I love the Olympics. I was really, really upset last year with, that we missed the Olympics, but I'm really excited this year that it looks like they're going ahead. It's, it's just a wonderful couple of weeks. I love all the sport. But there's something special about the world getting together. And that's a big part of what the Olympics is. It's a taste of the world as one, of the world as an international community uh, meeting together peacefully to play sport. And actually, that's part of what the Olympics is all about. The modern Olympic movement was founded in 1894 by Pierre de Corbetin. And world peace was an important value of the Olympics. Athletes would shake hands before and after their events. Countries at war would hold a ceasefire during the games. It was all about peace, gathering as one. Look at this statement from the Charter, the Olympic Games Charter. This is one of the goals. The goal of Olympism the Olympic movement or the Olympic Games, is to place sport at the service of the harmonious development of humankind with a view to promoting a peaceful society. What a fantastic thing. World peace, that's a part of what the Olympics is all about. And who doesn't want that? We all want that, don't we? But can it work? Can sport really achieve that? The history of the modern Olympic Games would question that. Let me show you a couple of examples amidst all the positive that happens in the Olympics. Go back to 1936 and the Olympics held in Berlin. And this man, this African-American man, Jesse Owens, won multiple gold medals at those games in Berlin. But Hitler who was hosting the games, refused to shake hands with Jesse Owens because he's black, not white. In fact, Hitler congratulated German medal winners only at the 1936 Olympics. Or to take another example, go to 1972 and the Munich Olympics and the terrorist attack that took place there when a group of Palestinian terrorists attacked and took hostage a group of Israeli athletes. And in a shootout at Munich Airport, all of those athletes were killed, along with five terrorists and one policeman. World peace? No. The Olympics, at their best, may be a taste of international community, but they've also been a place of deep-seated racism and hostility. So what is it that will build true international community? What will do it? What is it? Or come a little bit closer to our home, right? Let's think just Australia, which is a multicultural country. It may be one of the most multicultural countries in the world. I love seeing this front cover of Time magazine about 10 years ago about Australia... And it's all about the fact that Australia is multicultural. That's what the article was about. We have many cultures in Australia, praise God, but are we one? Are we one community with all those cultures? Again, friends, my question stands, what is it that builds true international community? What can do that? 
Well, friends, today's passage or passages help. They're very important passages. We're going to spend most of the time in Genesis. And it's one of the most important passages in the Bible for understanding culture, particularly multiculturalism. It's very important for us. We're going to learn about multiculturalism from Genesis 11. And we're going to learn what builds true international community. That's what we're going to learn. Let's dive in, friends. There was actually a time when the whole world really was one, with one culture and one language. Verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in China and settled there. It's hard to imagine what that would be like. The whole world speaking the same language. We're so used used to having a mix of languages and having to live with that. We're used to that. But when you think about it, it can be really hard having lots of different languages, can't it? A friend of mine works for the Bible Society as a Bible translator. He was telling me about one of their projects. They're translating the Bible into an indigenous and Aboriginal language in the Northern Territory. And he was telling me about how much work it is. It's a massive amount of work. Missionaries need to live among the people of this language for years. Years and years to get to know them, their culture and their language. To be able to translate the Bible. It's a whole lot of hard work. It's wonderful work. But it's not easy. Imagine this time when... Everyone spoke the same language, one culture, one language, the whole world. Think of what the world would achieve. How will it go? We should be a bit alarmed, even at the beginning of Genesis 11, with the reference to the east. I don't know if you noticed that, the east. It reminds us, friends, that mankind is east of Eden, The garden, the flaming sword that keeps humanity out of the garden is on the east side of the Garden of Eden. And mankind has been moving east ever since, Genesis 3. We should be worried when we see that word east. And what happens next is disastrous. Mankind united as one attempts to storm heaven. Verse 3, they said to each other, come. Let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. It's a massive building project. One of our kids, my second, our eldest boy, loves diggers, particularly when he was younger. Other parents would take their kids to playgrounds. I could just take Sam to a building site and and sit him in the pram watching a digger at work. He just absolutely loved it. Um, Well, friends, he would have loved Genesis 11 and Babel. It's all, it's it's digging, it's construction, it's it's a work site, Um, it's industry, it's technology, and it's exciting, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong so far. Genesis 11 is not anti-technology or anti-construction or anti-city or anti-tower. Technology is a gift. Think of some of the amazing technological advances in recent years. I was reading about Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon. He's planning to tour space very soon with his company, Blue Origin. I mean, I get excited about taking a tour to the Blue Mountains or the Hunter Valley. Uh, Jeff Bezos is about to take a tour into space. That's what our technology can do now. Think of medical technology or digital technology. What we can achieve is remarkable. No problem so far. It's verse 7 that's the problem. Have a look again. Verse 7. Come, let us build ourselves a city. A tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. That's the problem. They want to build a name 
but they don't want to build God's name. They want to build their name. Who do they want to boast to? Well, there's no one else to boast to. This is all of humanity united. They want to boast to God. This is humanity in rebellion against God. Seeking glory for themselves against God. That's why they're storming heaven. Heaven, in biblical thought, is God's throne. It's where God is. It's where God rules from. This is man storming heaven. Back in 1789, the citizens of France rushed into a prison called the Bastille. Uh, Several prisoners were held there by the monarchy and and a crowd of people poured into the prison, overthrew the guards and released the prisoners. And it's been called the Storming of the Bastille. It set off the French Revolution. There's a picture of it. Genesis 11 is the storming of heaven, or at least an attempt. It's mankind uniting to storm God's heaven. Does it sound familiar, friends? This is Genesis 3 all over again. Remember what Satan said to Eve back in Genesis 3? You will be like God, Satan whispered. Genesis 3 showed the first individuals rebelling against God. Genesis 11 shows mankind together rebelling against God. But it's the same thing. What will God do? Is God threatened? Is he worried? No, not at all. I just love verse 5. Verse 5, have a look at this. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. From where God was on the throne of heaven, he couldn't even see their tower. He had to get up and have a look. I think this is the idea of the language. It was a pitiful, puny attempt to get anywhere near God. He actually had to come down to even see this pathetic tower. As Isaiah has said about God, God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. We are tiny compared to God. What a stupid idea to think that we could threaten God or replace God or storm God's heaven. Stupid. But our world still does it. In all sorts of ways. Let me just talk of one example. Our church teaches scripture, the message about Jesus, in our local schools, in a number of our local schools, which is an absolutely wonderful thing. At the same time, primary ethics is taught. You might think it's a harmless thing. What's the purpose of primary ethics? Let me read to you from the website. This is from the Primary Ethics website. Students are encouraged to make their own judgments about whether something is right or wrong, good or bad, and to explain why. All primary ethics classes are based on this approach as distinct from a blind appeal to authority. This is humanity uniting against God. It's another example. Making up our own laws, deciding for ourselves what's right and wrong, instead of listening to God. It's people, humanity, getting together with their children, teaching our children to ignore what God has said and to make up our own rules. It's a pitiful attempt to storm heaven, happening in our schools. What will God do? God judges humanity. He divides us from each other by mixing up our languages and by scattering us over the face of the earth. Verse 6, the Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, 
Let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Friends, here is the beginning of multilingual society, of multiculturalism. And what I want us to see is that it's not a blessing. It's actually a curse. It's a part of the judgment of God to divide us from each other. When God says in verse 6 that nothing will be impossible for them, it's not as though God is threatened or worried God is concerned for how far our evil will reach. So God mixes up our languages and he scatters us across the earth to slow us down in our descent into evil. By dividing us from each other, we're less effective in our collective rebellion against God. Here's a... Here's a prop that I like to bring out from time to time. I haven't brought it out for a while. Um, I love this prop. Imagine that each of these dots, these red uh, shapes, is a person. Imagine that each one of them is a person. Genesis 11 begins with humanity united as one, one language, but in rebellion against God. So God, in his judgment with both languages and geography, scatters us from each other dividing us from each other and scatters us across the surface of the earth. That is what Genesis 11 is all about. This is the judgment of God. And experience bears this out. Let me just talk about one US researcher, but I think his findings would apply in Australia as well. Uh, This man, Dr. Robert Putnam, he has spent decades studying What leads to a flourishing society? What leads to a healthy society? Where people are healthy and happy. What is it? That's what he's interested in from a research point of view. He's not a Christian man. He's a Jewish man. And what he's found is that the healthiest and happiest, the thriving societies, the flourishing societies, are those where there's lots of relating, lots of friendship, lots of community groups, lots of organisations... Lots of time for lots of people to do lots of things together. And what he's found is that in the US, the most ethnically diverse parts of the US have the lowest experiences of true community. The lowest levels of community involvement or community service or cross-cultural friendship or volunteer involvement. People's trust of each other is actually low as they retreat into their own insular cultural ghetto. What he's found is that multiculturalism by itself fractures rather than builds genuine community. Now, this shouldn't surprise us. Genesis 11 teaches us that it's the judgment of God to limit our capacity for evil. What hope is there, friends? And what hope is there? The answer, friends, is not the United Nations. The answer is not the Olympic Games. As good as those things are, the answer, friends, is the gospel. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the answer. Our second Bible reading, the reading that Nikki gave us from Acts chapter 2, was from the day of Pentecost when God poured out his spirit on his people. And what did we see then in that reading? This was the reverse of Babel. People are gathered from many nations, but there isn't misunderstanding. There's understanding given by the spirit of God as a taste of what's to come. And what was being spoken at Babel Mankind plotted together to storm heaven and build a name for themselves. At Pentecost, 
with the pouring out of the Spirit, the disciples aren't advancing their name, they're advancing God's name. Verse 11, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Friends, this is the reversal of the curse of Babel. And it's all because we live in the day of the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, friends, at Babel, God judged humanity with separation, with scattering. But this was never God's plan, never God's ultimate plan. God's plan has always been blessing, the blessing of being gathered. And that's what God has done for us through Christ. See, in Christ, in Jesus' death on the cross for our sins, all of us, no matter who we are, no matter what culture we come from, no matter what language we speak, all of us can be reconciled to God as his child. And as we're gathered back to God, we're gathered to each other. Think again of my prop friends. Remember, that was after Babel, the scattering of people across the world with language and geography. But God in the gospel, imagine God at the center. God in the gospel of Jesus Christ gathers people to himself. And look at those red shapes on the surface. What happens to them, friends? People, as they gather to God, they gather to each other. They are united together across cultures and across languages, one through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So friends, again, where do we enjoy true international community now? Is it at the Olympics? Is it in multicultural Australia? It's at church. That's where we experience true international community, friends. Church. A church like ours today, this morning. Church is a place not just of different cultural groups in segregated clusters. Church is a family, a community, a place of fellowship, a place of hospitality, a place of welcome, where everyone's welcome, no matter what tribe or tongue. It's a place where, according to Paul, the apostle, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. We might say there's neither Arab nor Turk, Kenyan nor Chinese, Afghani or Iranian, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Let me come back to Dr. Robert Putnam. Do you know the one place he found true international community in all his research in the United States? The one place? Church. Have a look. Remember, he's not a Christian. During ongoing research on the changing role of religion, my colleagues and I have attended numerous services over the last several years in churches across America. In many large evangelical congregations, the participants constituted the largest thoroughly integrated gatherings we have ever witnessed. Fascinating. The one place where multiculturalism didn't break down community was at church, in Christian gatherings. Of course, we shouldn't be surprised, friends, for we share the Spirit of God. Praise be to God. We are united as one. And our job now, friends, it's to keep the unity that God has built. That's our job, to maintain the unity that God has won in the gospel. Not to build it. God's already built it through Christ. We keep it. That's our job. Ephesians 4 verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We've got to keep what God has built. Yes, friends, we enjoy talking with people who are like us in our church. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a problem if that's all we do. So that's not all we do. We do more than that. We talk with, we build friendships with people who are unlike us. With people who are nothing like us. Yes, it's fine to sit next to and, and talk to people from our culture. That's natural. 
But we're not a natural community. We're a supernatural community with the Spirit of God filling us. So we do more than that, friends. We cut across our cultures in love, welcoming everyone, enjoying hospitality with everyone, including people entirely unlike us. For friends, we live not under the curse of Babel, but under the blessing of Pentecost and the poured out spirit of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to him. Let's thank God, friends, for his grace and let's pray together. Please join me. Father God, we give you great thanks for your amazing grace in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for sending your son, our saviour, to die on the cross for our sins that we might be gathered to you. And Father, we praise you that as we're gathered to you through the gospel, we're gathered to each other as an international community. And Father, here in our church this morning, we rejoice. We rejoice to be gathered to you and to be gathered to each other. Father, thank you that the judgment of Babel was never your final plan. Thank you, Father God, that in the gospel you have reversed it. And so now... We call upon you together as our one Father, in the name of our one Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the power of your one poured out Spirit. So Father God, as your gathered people, would you help us to keep the unity that you have built. Father, help us to continue to build friendships with one another, even with people who are different to ourselves. And Father, we pray that you would get the glory as people join us and look on and see the supernatural miracle of this truly united international community of your people. And as the world looks on, Father, even in our little suburb here, may some of them want to know you, the God, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has done this great work. And so, Father, may our truly united church bring glory to Jesus, who has united us to you. So, Father, we thank you again for your grace. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.